Hi everyone, my name is Denise Hughes. I'm the Senior Director of Programming for the Angelica Film Center in New York, and I'm the curator for Angelica Anywhere. Today we have the pleasure of welcoming the actor, director, um, screenwriter, and composer, and I don't know what else he did, of um, the film Falling. Academy Award nominee, Viggo Mortensen. So, Hello. <laughs> hi Viggo, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, nice to see you. Okay. Um, so did I leave anything else out of the, is that, or did you do, what else did you do for the film? I'm following. Uh, well, I was the producer of uh, Origin. I mean, I was by myself for years trying to find the money for it. Um, not the first time. For 25 years, I've been writing different scripts and trying to raise money to make a movie. Uh, first one I was able to make as a director was was Falling. And um, so I started on my own and I found Lance Henriksen uh, first and, uh, you know, started thinking about, I used the time. It took, you know, four years and a few tries before we raised the, enough money to start shooting. And so I just tried to use the time to work on the script, to think about where we'd want to shoot and how and what the team would be, the crew, the cast, and uh, and worked on other things too, the music. I mean, I composed the music as well. Um, and just out of necessity, had to sort of multitask and, and just be stubborn about it until it either was going to work or didn't. It, finally, it did. Uh, we even started shooting, to be honest, um, in the picture when you you know, that you've seen, obviously there's nature is very important as a connection, as a memory element for both the father played by Lance Henriksen and my character, John, and for that family, you know, um, there's a connection with their natural environment. And I knew that I wanted to use nature in the memories of these characters and I wanted it in different seasons. So before we had the financing, I called the cinematographer Marcel Ziskin and I said, and, and production designer Carol Spear, two people that had been on board for a long time. Carol Spear, I know from working on Cronenberg's movies, she always is his production designer. She's excellent, Canadian. And Marcel Ziskin is a, is a Danish cinematographer that I worked with. He shot Two Faces of January, which was the, the first directorial effort of screenwriter Jose Namini which I think was shown at, at the Angelica. And um, if I'm not mistaken, I don't know. Um, anyway, so I said to them, let's get together. Let's go find these, this farm and these other locations and bring the camera. Let's get the camera that we're gonna use. You know, we want a wide format. We wanna start playing with that. And let's start shooting uh, these, these memory fragments. And in a way, what I was doing, I just was tired of waiting. I thought, okay, let's just start. Let's pretend we're making a movie <laughs> and maybe it'll be contagious and other people will say, hey, look, it looks like they're making a movie. Let's, let's go see this. Maybe let's join them. And that is kind of what happened. I finally got a Canadian co-producer and a British uh, co-producer and ended up putting together a, a complex, not as complex as some independent productions, but a, uh, a co-production, a, a European Canadian co-production of a movie that takes place in the United States. So um, I really like the film. I think um, there's many things that I like about it. One, uh, one of the things that I like about it is um, that this is a story about like forgiveness and acceptance uh, and how universal it is because right now like in this film like you're talking about dementia but if you replace dementia with any other issue it's pretty much a journey that we all have to do with like accepting and forgiving our parents and mm -hmm. so that is and, each, um, other. and yeah. each other in a way i mean you can't really forgive people if you don't understand them you have to make an effort there and i think also i mean this movie is coming out tomorrow, today, whatever, the 5th of February in the United States, finally. And by the time we finally arrived in theaters and all platforms, it, the story is much more timely than I ever imagined it might be. And that's because we have a serious communication problem in the United States. 
other places as well in the world, obviously, to the point where it's almost like another pandemic, really. Uh, you have the COVID pandemic, uh, which is very serious, but you have an equally serious pandemic that's probably going to last a lot longer than COVID, and that yeah. is the poor communication or no communication <laughs> pandemic. And you're not going to cure that with a vaccine. You can only cure it by doing something which is takes work and sacrifice, sacrificing your ego and opening your mind and your heart, which is to listen to people that you don't agree with, especially. It's easy to talk to people and hang out with people that you're all in agreement and just sit in your corner but um, and consume news that reinforces your position. But open your mind to other thoughts you know it's something that we've done in the past in our society right now we're not doing it very well and this reflects what happens in the family story in falling which is you know i guess i mean i don't like movies that give you answers tell you what to think or feel what this movie does is hopefully pose some questions including are there people you can't communicate with are there people that don't deserve to be communicated with i don't happen to think so I'm not saying that, I'm not telling anybody what to do, but this is a story in which an extra effort is made out of necessity, out of affection, out of a memory of a time when the bonds of connection, of affection were not entirely broken. And it's like trying to rebuild something that once sort of worked, you know, uh, which is similar to what we need to do in our society, I think. So, so it is a timely moment Unfortunately, in a way, um, but it, we are where we're at, and I think we have to look forward and 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 try to do something about it. And I think this story, you know, I mean, the best movie stories, and I'm not saying that this is like the best movie story. I'm just saying movie it's pretty story. Pretty good, though. It's pretty good. <laughs> movie stories that are thought provoking and deal with an issue like that communication in an honest uncompromising way without trying to resolve everything at the end and like oh we're all happy and the, the old guy cried and realized he was wrong and apologized to everyone eh, doesn't doesn't usually happen in life but what happens with good stories is they they can help us remind us that we don't have to live alone with our fears and doubts but we can share them with other people and sometimes stories good stories whether they're books or movies they can help us realize that remind us you know we're not alone we other people have problems that are not so different from us and maybe we can connect even this pandemic this covid pandemic yeah. i think ideally reminds us of of a fact that's always true that's always been there which is that life is short it's precious it's fragile you could get sick and die at any time no matter who you are and obviously covid has <laughs> made that very clear to everyone young and old and so I, I try to look at the glass as being half full, I suppose. It's like, okay, well, what can we do with what's going on? And can a story be told about it, even if indirectly it deals with it? And I think that without even consciously trying to do that, those of us who worked on falling maybe are contributing a little bit to the discussion of at least how do we find a way to communicate with people that we have so much trouble with, you know? Yeah. yeah, and that's another thing that I really like, that you're not making it, like, you're not apologizing for who, like, Willis is, I, it's like, and you're doubled down in it, and you're also, you're not spooning, it's, uh, spoon feeding this story to people, like, as an audience, you have to also do a work with, like, yeah. accepting him as he is, and this relationship, and just figure out it's it's like as an audience member it's also hard to take on all these like aggression and yeah. but no and i understand you know, it's, it. it's difficult it's impossible uh it's not even a goal that you should have to make a movie that everybody's gonna like when people try to do that whether they're studio movies or you know whatever mm -hmm. usually it's really expensive productions and it's like an economic necessity okay we have to secure our investment uh, we can't take a big loss, so we have to just repeat formulas, you know, that are well tried and true. And and so then you get a kind of a homogeneity and a predictability in a lot of stories. But I like stories that don't tell you what to think and feel. I like stories 
you know, I mean, I made the kind of movie I'd like to go see ideally. And that's a movie that you're watching in the 10, first 10 or 15 minutes, something about it, the way it's shot, the writing, something about it gets your attention. And then you're sort of in. And if it's not constantly telling you with the photography and the acting and the, even the music, what to think and feel all the time, then it's respecting your intelligence and you kind of take part without even thinking about it. You start, you participate in the storytelling. So that by the end of the movie, for better or for worse, the story is yours as much as it is the the, yeah. the authors, you know? And that's that's the kind of, I mean, those are the kind of movies you guys show, obviously, most of the time. And I, and I appreciate that. That's, it's a great movie theater uh, complex that you guys have. But, you know, it's... You know, the, the thing, one of the things that I've learned and the person who put it the best, I mean, I'm paraphrasing, uh, somebody I was lucky to meet just before she died was Agnes Barda, the great oh, yeah. uh, director uh, that died, you know, a couple of years ago. She said to me, you know, when she heard that I was going to try to direct Falling, she said, oh, OK, well, don't show the audience anything. And I said, what do you mean? She goes, don't show them things create in them by virtue of the quality of your storytelling a need a desire to see things for themselves i said that sounds that's exactly you i could never have put it as well as that but that's what i feel and that's what i've always felt and so that's what we we try to do and i think that people appreciate that and not just you know angelica audience but people in general are much smarter than than producers and directors and storytellers often give them credit for. They can think for themselves. They can understand. They don't need to be shown every scene or have voiceover to explain everything that's happening about the dynamic between the characters or the past history. Give a few pieces of the puzzle here and there once in a while. They'll put it together in their way. And you can't control how they're going to put it together. And that's fine. That's great. It's called sharing a story, you know. And then you do with it what you want. That's why I love and miss real Q&As. Because every time you sit in a movie theater, you know, it's a different movie. The vibe that you get sitting there with the audience. And I remember I did a tour while it was still possible last okay. fall in some European countries by car, carefully, mass distancing, all that, where I would present the movie in a movie theater different countries, right? And, you know, at the end in the Q&A, it was great because I could see there was some universal application of the story, which always makes you happy, different cultures, languages, but they they got this story of this family, they identified with it, even made comments that showed that they had a personal, emotional connection with the story. But what was great is that each time I sat there and I would, you know, I've seen the movie thousands of times and, you know, I was there every day for the editing, everything, every aspect of it every rewrite everything you know so i know it in backwards and forwards and i you know i would sit down for the first few minutes i want to hear if the sound is right and see if the lamps are right the image is right a few minutes and then take off and come back for the q a that was the idea almost every time i get sucked in i'm watching a few minutes well i watch another scene let's see how they react to this one and then each audience is slightly different so it's a, like watching a different movie each time which I love. And I, and almost every time I ended up sitting through the whole thing, someone would come and whisper, weren't you going to go get a sandwich and come back? No, I think I'm just going to watch, you know, I love seeing the movie with audiences. And although I can't see the people that are listening to this, um, I thank you for seeing our movie, whatever you think of it, um, at least giving it a chance, hopefully from start to finish. Um, it's difficult. It's a difficult thing, a character like Willis, you know, yeah. he's, he's offensive. He's very difficult. Um, and for some people that maybe have different experiences in life, maybe haven't taken care of someone like that, you know, and maybe it's easier to dismiss, well, shit, I don't want to listen to that. Why should I listen to that? It's offensive as hell. It's all, it's repetitive. You know, if I want to do that, I'll go listen to some crazy guy and sit in his house for two hours for free and be abused. Why do I have to pay and go see this? Um, I understand that, but it's intentional and it's realistic. It's intentional in terms of narrative because I wanted to create a particular kind of tension where it's just to the breaking point until it finally just snaps. 
I can't take it anymore. It's so <laughs> offensive as it is for the character I'm playing in the story. He's not a saint. He's just made a decision. If any, he's only going to probably allow me maybe to take care of him. He's an old man in spite of all his faults. He's my dad. He needs help mentally and physically. And if anybody's going to do it, it's going to be me, if he even lets me. But in order to help him, I'm going to have to listen to a lot of crap and try to shine it and just, you know, deal with it, yeah. not, not <laughs> respond. And that's a difficult thing to do, and it's a difficult thing to watch. I understand that, but it's part of the, that's the situation of that family, and I have to say it's it's a situation of our country to some degree right now. Let me tell you that it, it it was really hard to watch, but at the end of the day, I think that that's one of the things that stay with me most because after, like I turned, like after the film ended, like I felt it was emotionally draining, like going through that. But I kept thinking about the film for days after that, and like how I would have approached the situation would have been would have had the strength that John had in this like of just accepting someone like that and and as I said before like it, it just takes you back of like your own, own personal reality like well whatever it is your personal story or with a relative a friend or, or mm. anyone that you're taking care of um, it just brings you back to that maybe you didn't you never had someone as aggressive at Willis but you had some you encounter that situation sometimes, you know, in your life. So most people um, can identify with some aspect of it. One second. Eh, ah, vas a vas al entreno. Dale. Bueno, suerte. Eh, necesitas plata. Necesitas plata, Leo. No. Dale. Suerte. Chao. Sorry. Uh, the boy in the house is going to basketball practice. Um, uh, what was I gonna say? No, that it stays. It stays with you, and like you can make a connection at, at some level. Like there's many different aspects, but yeah. these, I mean, John, these... my character, he ultimately, he's not a saint. He's you can see it. It's difficult for him to like put up with this crap that he has to put up with to help this old man. And in the end, ultimately, he fails. He can't hack it. In the end, it takes a long time, but he finally just blows and says things that he probably regrets, and they both do, and it's horrible and intense, you know, <clears throat> but in some way, I suppose, necessary. I'm not telling anybody that they should do what John does. Each person makes their own decision in a situation yeah. like that. It's just showing a situation, posing questions, and then you can take it however you want. Now, to reject, I think, this particular movie story out of hand because you don't like that or you wouldn't do that, that's not a valid argument against the movie in my opinion and some yeah, people have made that even some critics have said this is bullshit or even some critics that maybe mm. i don't know they call themselves critics but they're not i don't know how much they know about film history or what it is to tell a movie story but they i've even read something somewhere or somebody told me about it where somebody said well this director is obviously homophobic and racist and misogynist misogynistic and he's just using this as a platform to vent all like, oh, wow. it's like saying if i play jack the ripper I'm a, I'm a murderer of, of women or something. I mean, it's like, you know, yeah. I'm not saying, it doesn't mean, you, you can you can reject, you can say, oh, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't put up with this. Um, it's in, But to say the story is invalid because a person in the story decides he is going to help this person in spite of all his faults, that's just human nature and a human choice that one yeah. person has. Yeah. Um, let me ask you about other thing that it caught my attention. It was that um, Willis had this, uh, you know, this very complicated relation with everyone in his family, except with Monica, which yeah. is um, a Latina Hispanic girl. And you would think that because of like how he interacts, he would be very, or, or like he wouldn't like her, but it looks like it is as if they have like is the old, the only honest mm. uh, relationship he has is with Monica. Well, she's the granddaughter, right? And yes, yeah. you would think because she's she's of you know Central American origin, yeah. you know racially and everything, all the things we've heard Willis say, and but and you know it's like, well, why would he like her? That would be the worst, right, um, for him. And no, 
what happens there is that she sees her grandfather as unusual, funny, wacky, crazy, even though he says these offensive things, some of the words which she doesn't even understand, but she knows that he upsets his parents and other people, but she likes him. What happens there and why Willis appreciates her so much on, the, on one hand is because there's no judgment. They don't judge, and so he doesn't judge her because she doesn't judge him. She's not trying to fix him like I am and my sister is. Yeah. She doesn't have that baggage, so that's an interesting relationship. There's also another thing that you see in a lot of families where a parent that, that maybe was really tough on their own kids, suddenly as grandparents, they're doting and, you know, yeah. to the point where the parent is saying, well, where was that when I was a kid? You know, <laughs> that, that nice, kind behavior and that fun, you know, they're reading stories to them. They're playing with them <laughs> no, together. No. They're taking naps together. It's like, what the hell? Where did that come from? That's me with and my maybe mom. Maybe it's a <laughs> yeah. thing that, that human beings do. It's like without even realizing it, that grandparent maybe realizes, like I say, without even being conscious of it, okay, I have another chance to do mm -hmm. it differently. But I think it's more this generational that, you know, there's a jump of a generation and there isn't this judgment. It's just like, my grandfather is a character, you know, he's fun. Not my grandfather is horrible. What is he saying? You know, and that's what happens there. And you see other, you know, Laura Linney's kids and the, the teenage kids, they're older and yeah. they are more, they have some baggage, but not the same as I do or, or their mother does, which is they have no problem just calling him out. Like when he goes over the line and says something offensive, especially against their mother, they tell him to go, you know, screw himself basically. And they don't have no problem with it. They don't, they don't have some lingering, oh, I shouldn't have said that. No, it's like, you know, fuck off grandpa. Sorry, that, that, that's not okay. And um, it's interesting. You see that different generations have different relationships. Yeah. And um, another thing it's, uh, that I liked is how you structure the film, right? Like you are telling a story about dementia and losing memory, but at the same time, it's all about flashbacks and memories. And so when you um, wrote the script and when you were thinking about it, uh, thinking about the, the, how you were gonna uh, structure it, was it always like that? Did you write the script this way or this is something that you know, it was like evolved as you wrote the script? Well, though it was frustrating to wait so many years to finally get the money to shoot, the advantage was is I used that time to refine the script and refine the script so that we wouldn't have to cut a bunch of scenes in the editing because it wasn't really refined. It was written that way. And the structure, I knew it was complicated and that would probably be part of the reason it would be difficult to raise the money, apart from the fact that I'd never shown that I could direct. It doesn't matter, you know, if you're a relatively familiar face as a performer for potential investors and some of the public um, because of movies you've been in as an actor. If you haven't ever made a movie or a short even, you have no proof that you can direct it. So I understand that reticence there. Also story-wise, complex structure. It was written that way. I first wrote it out as a short story and then I realized, no, visually I can picture this. So I think it's a screenplay. So then I wrote it as a screenplay and, and respected the structure of the story and you know, exploring how subjective memory is really, and how memory can maybe, even memory about difficult moments, can remind you of those bonds of connection that you once had, that maybe, you know, maybe there's something there. There was a time when we could talk. Maybe we can use those memories to help us now, again, in the present and so forth. But that was there, and during the shoot, you know, I tweaked a little bit. I mean, you continue writing essentially as you prepare and as you shoot, it's almost like another rewrite. And then when you get to, um, when you get to, to, to the editing room, it's that last chance to rewrite, you know, or to, to add one last pass at the screenplay essentially. And I did change some, some things. Um, I changed some, um, things, you know, from one place to another. Uh, not a lot, but a few things I restructured. It's essentially the script. It's, I mean, I was just the other day because I had to write out the script according to what the movie is. And I'm 
I was in the process of doing that. So I was looking at the final shooting script before we started shooting and then at the movie comparing. And it's, it's not terribly different. There are some things that have moved around, like the duck story that goes through the first third and is, and is a vehicle in a way to introduce the audience to this family and its dynamics, father, son, mother, son, husband, wife dynamics, and the family, very important, the family's connection to nature. Uh, and life and death and lots of things. So those, I sort of spread them out a little bit in a different way than I, in the script. And I saved one piece, the final piece of that duck story for the end, because I liked having it there where you now knew a lot more about Willis and the relationship between the father and son and to have them back to back, two scenes that happen in the exact same place, 45 years in between them, the same table the father's sitting in the same place 45 years later. The son is sitting where the mother was. It's the same place, but it's it looks like a junkyard. I mean, the father is living in isolation, this bachelor this who's bitter and isolated, but happy when he's on his own. Great with nature and animals, um, not so good with people. Um, and there they are. And some of the behaviors are similar in the scene that happens in 1962 and the kitchen looks sparkling and well cared for, you know, he's listening to the radio, some country music at full volume, because that's what he does. He's working all day on the farm and he has dinner and he wants dinner served when he wants it. And he has his beer and, and he's listening to radio full volume, regardless of what other people want or if they want to talk. And then 45 years later, he's watching a Western on his little TV in the middle of all his junk and broken chainsaws and, you know, stuff. And the son is witnessing the same thing. You know, he's not four now, he's 50 and he's watching his father and he's trying to have a conversation even though the volume is, you know, way up on this, you know. So it's, it was, yeah. it was I realized that in the editing, that should go there. You'll see more in that, knowing what you know now by the end of the story. And so those were some of the changes. So this was your first film as a director, as you said, and now that, it so first of all, I would like to know, like, how was the experience of directing? Is it something that you enjoy? And then now that you've proven that you can actually direct, are you thinking about doing a second one or where are you at? I love the experience. I knew it would be difficult. I mean, I've been around a long time. I've produced some movies and I've always taken an interest from the beginning of my career as an actor. Uh, I, I've never been the kind of actor that, I mean, I hardly get to know my, trailer or my dressing room. I never am there. I'm always on the set. I always like to see what's going on. I've always been fascinated by what happens. How do you take something from the page to the screen? It's a very complex journey. It can be done really well uh, as a team effort collectively. And, and I've always been fascinated by all the different departments. I mean, before I was an actor, I was a photographer and a writer and, and always a film goer. I mean, my mom took me to the movies first time when I was three when we lived in Argentina, actually. And we went all the time to the movies. I mean, and she would take me to movies that were more for grown-ups. I mean, I remember seeing West Side Story and Lawrence of Arabia and Argentine movies, you know, like a movie you would know since you're from there, Cronica de un Niño Solo, and, you know, okay. Fabio, Leonardo Fabio's first movie. And lots of movies. I saw those with my mother, and my mother always talked about story, you know. I, I realize now that that's strange that moms don't go to the movies with their kids when they're that young so much. Those kind of and they don't talk about story like two screenwriters. She would, she would always talk about what's not in the movie, what's not shown, often appreciating the fact, uh, what's not said, what might have been said, that that was as powerful as what's not as what's in the screenplay. And these were the kind of conversations that we always had. And when I got, when I grew up and left home, when I would go to visit her, you know, it was almost like, you know, one of the first things I would say to her, hey, you want to go to the movies? And we would go. You know, I remember when I was first, not, you know, from home, for example, 15 years after seeing, uh, for example, when I was four, Lawrence of Arabia with her in this huge movie theater in Buenos Aires. Um, 15 years later or so, I invited her to go see The Deer Hunter when that was out. And, uh, and we had this long conversation afterward. I remember very well. She was like, she was very interested in Meryl, Meryl Streep's character 
and Christopher Walken's character, so was I. And she talked a long time about what she imagined Chris Walken's character had been up to in Saigon, you know, before that end scene where he seems like out of his mind playing Russian roulette with Robert De Niro's character. And um, it was a really interesting conversation. And those are the kind of things that like storytellers talk about, you know, or cinephile. <laughs> Is that why you're a writer now? Is that how you became a writer? <laughs> anyway, what I'm saying is I've always liked movies as stories, as, as things. And so yeah. I, that's why I wanted to direct, you know, just to try it. And, um, but it wasn't so different. I, I guess I wasn't surprised that it would be difficult um, and that it involved ideally a collective effort. And that's the best examples from directors that have directed me over the years has been that, you know, a good idea can come from anyone, listen to everybody, no matter how well prepared your project is that you've written uh, or that you're going to direct and, and you're going to finally decide what the final cut is and all that. But underway, you could get a good idea can come from somebody. Just keep your eyes open, your ears open. Don't take it as a threat to your authority. It's like use the use the tools, use the people that are with you, do it together, you know, so... These are things that I really enjoyed. Uh, I knew it would be difficult and I hoped it would be fun and an inspiration. And it was much more so than I, I dreamed it, it might be. So I'm anxious to do it again. And I hope, I, I trust that now I do have evidence that I did direct <laughs> yeah. the movie and some people like it fortunately. So, so hopefully next time it'll be a little easier. During the pandemic, I did write a couple of news stories and I'm gonna to try to make one of those next year. And I already have a producer interested, which is new. I won't have to do it all by myself to start with. And I, I do, that's one thing I really need. I need more help and I hope this time I'll have it. No, yeah, well, that's, start. well, we hope that you make another one like that. Or personally, I do. Um, and then the other question that I have for you is, um, I love the cast that you assemble for this for mm -hmm. this uh, film. It's so diverse, and um, it's. Did you write the parts? Did you have these actors in mind when you wrote the script, or this is something? So tell me about the casting process. How how did it work? I didn't write them. I wrote them as they basically are in the movie. You know that was the blueprint. Um, but hoping as an actor that they would bring something else and surprise me. And they all did, they all did. And I have to say for this particular story, this cast from four-year-old Grady McKenzie, who's the duck hunter boy, who plays me younger at four, all the way to Lance Henriksen, who is now 80 years old. It's like the all-star cast for this particular story. I couldn't, if every single one, it's what you hope always, it's an ensemble that works perfectly for me. I believe all of them as the characters they're playing. And I really enjoyed the casting process. Um, you have to be lucky too, that some of the gambles that you make, like when I picked Grady, who's four, we had been seeing kids who were very good, all of them. And they were, you know, six, seven, eight, but they were like kids who were small for their age because they were more mature. They'd acted in some cases and mm. take direction. You know, it's a difficult part. There's, there's, you know, yeah. There's dialogue. He has to shoot a gun. He has to, you know, don't jump in freezing water. He has to be in a bathtub with a dead duck. Sleep with it. I mean, there's a lot of stuff he has to do. And, um, but there was something about this kid. He walked in the room and he hadn't had no experience, and he was much smaller and younger. He was four. He walks in and it was like the sun came out of the clouds. And I went, whoa. And then we did the scene couple scenes and then I said well try it differently let's do it now like you're kind of sad okay and he did that and it was perfect so he was more flexible as it turned out than the other kids who had learned everything by rote and were really good uh he was I don't know and I said to the casting director Deirdre Bowen they never get mentioned and she's an awesome casting director Canadian casting director David Cronenberg's casting director among others uh Deirdre I said to her he left the room. I said, well, he's the one, clearly. And she said, mm, he's four. And I said, yeah. And she goes, think of the things he has to do. And what if he gets tired or he's bored or he doesn't feel like it? He gets to, you know, it's four. I said, I don't know. I just have a feeling. And then I talked to his mom and I said, well, what do you think? I mean, could he, would you be okay if he shot a shotgun? 
And she says, he'd probably love it. And I said, well, no, it's not a very much of a stage mom. That's pretty interesting. And then I said, what about swimming? Can he swim? Oh, yeah. And can he, would he be okay? I mean, we had put some protection on his clothes, but could he swim in, you know, cold water? She goes, he, he's an ice hockey player. I say, he is already? Oh, yeah, yeah. He's got his playing card and everything. I go, oh, excellent. Um, so <laughs> everything was okay. And I said, he might hear some foul language too. He's got older brothers, not a problem. I said, okay, <laughs> or siblings, yeah. So that worked out, but it was a gamble. It's true, he could have, he's very little, he could have got bored. Can I tell you one story about him? I really- Sure, sure. Very sure. brief. His first day of work, his first shot ever, I think, is when he runs downstairs after finding that the duck is gone and he runs and he stops in the doorway and sees his mom's plucking the duck, his duck, and says, hey, that duck is mine. And she says, this duck is dinner. And then he has to deal with that realization. And um, so anyway, I said, you're going to come from off camera. And he looks at the camera. I, go, I mean, it just means that you're you're outside the door and you'll come into the doorway and you stop right here. OK, just in the doorway. And then you say that duck is mine. All right. OK. We practice it once. And try it once. And he did it. It's perfect. OK. All right. So when I say I'll, they'll say roll camera and all that and I'll say action looking at you and then you go and do that. Right. And so we first take, roll camera, sound speed, blah, 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 action Grady. And he starts jumping around and going, yeah, yeah, yeah. But he's not coming forward. And I go, and I go, cut, cut, cut. What are you doing? He goes, I'm doing action. And I go, yes, you are. <laughs> and I said, uh, I said, <laughs> okay, let's try it again. This time, I'm just going to say, when it's time for you to go, to come to this spot, I'll just say, go, right? He goes, okay, did it perfect. So that worked, and then we kept shooting that way. Then I went to get a cup of coffee or something. And I went, I left the set for a minute, because then we were sort of, now we were friends, right? And hanging out, And but I left. And I guess when I left, he didn't see me go. And he's running around and goes, where's the boy who says go? Where's the boy who says go? And everybody's like, what is he talking about? And, and, and his mom said, I think he's talking about the director. And so when I came back, I was told this story. And I said, that's, Awesome, I love that. And I even thought maybe the credit should say not directed by Viggo Mortensen, it should say Viggo Mortensen, the boy who says go, but probably nobody would have understood. But I love that he thought I was a boy, first of all, that was amazing. <laughs> I'm I mean, sure. Anyway. But I'm uh, very happy with that process, you know, uh, the casting, it was a really, I learned a lot and it's so crucial, you know, as, as David Cronenberg said to me before, you know, and he's a great example because he doesn't really interfere with the actors or say much of anything to them as long as they're it's working it's only if they need help you know so he's like hands off in a way he's overseeing what's happening but he trusts his casting and he works really hard on it he says if you've done the casting right that's a big part of the job done mm -hmm. as far as that goes and uh, and then trust the material trust what your choice is in each for each character mm -hmm. so i tried to do that with all the actors everybody needs different handling every every individual is different but uh yeah I, I really had a good experience from casting and working with the actors it was it was great so how was directing yourself like is it like were you like did you know exactly what you wanted to do and you got it right the first time or were you hypercritical and never happy how how was that experience of just well yeah. as the director Viggo Mortensen I would say about the actor Viggo Mortensen that he was always on time. I mean, he <laughs> never showed up later than I did. So that was really a relief. He was always ready to work when I was ready to work. So that was helpful. No, but seriously, I, I was a little um, tentative. I was worried about it. And it was not my first intention. I wasn't going to play. I wasn't going to be in the, the movie. Um, but when it failed the first time around, and I'd been through, as I say, you know, a couple of decades of trying to get things made. I thought, oh, this looks like it's going to go the same way. I'm not going to be able to raise the money. Uh, well, if I'm in it, um, maybe I'll help just get the that last bit of financing together. And it did help. And I also thought, you know, and then it begs the question, well, why don't you cast some, try to get some other name actor in there and you still don't have to be in it. I said, well, for one thing, I had been working for a few years with Lance and working on this relationship and, 
so I could continue that. It was working, how we were acting out the scenes together, working on the script. And for another, as a producer, to be honest, I could, um, it was good casting. I thought it worked. I would believe that I was Lance's son. And, uh, and Sferi or Goodness, son who plays the younger Willis, his son, it made sense looks wise and stuff and age wise. But also as a producer, I could and did decide that that actor didn't need to get paid. And we could put that money into, you know, getting shooting a few more days. <laughs> and uh, so that's how that came about. Uh, and I was nervous about it, but because we prepared with the crew and the cast, everything so well, we had a very specific plan of action, open to ideas from others on, on any given day, but we knew what we were gonna do each day. Production design, you know, lighting, camera work, you know, what the shots were going to be. So it wasn't that difficult. And I have to say that I think, particularly for Lance Henriksen, with whom I have most of my scenes, um, I wasn't, the fact that I wasn't just directing or trying to create an atmosphere in which he could do good work and be relaxed and get the most out of the character, um, I was also in the thick of it with him as an actor on an equal footing. In other words, we together had to somehow as a team figure out how to negotiate the obstacle courses of some scenes which are long and complicated emotionally and we were in the same boat and that was helpful plus selfishly speaking i had the best seat in the house i'm like that close i'm watching him do these amazing things that i beyond what i had written you know just his reactions nonverbal, like way he goes in and out of different mental states line readings that I would have never imagined. Um, you know, even acting with him in some scenes, I would suddenly think, oh, wow, I can't wait to get in the editing room with that. That's wonderful. And then, oh, my line, better get back. To <laughs> but I was relaxed because I was doing what actors should do anyway, which is pay attention to everything in the room. Because anything can stimulate what you're doing as a performer. And as far as the other actor opposite you or other actors, Everything about their face, about the tone of voice, their gestures is of interest. As a director, it's all of interest because it's all, it's, it's the material you're going to have to cut the movie together. And, um, and it's your soundtrack, you know. So, so I was hyper aware of everything about Lance and everything around him at all times, which strangely uh, allowed me to be more relaxed than, than ever. I, I, w I didn't second guess myself. I didn't have time. It didn't enter my mind. I wasn't so self-conscious. I was just serving the scene and reacting in a real way to what I was getting from Lance. And, you know, I would argue that the foundation of any good acting is good reacting. And that's what I was doing. So it didn't end up being as hard. Yes, it was harder because I had to prepare and memorize stuff and all that as I thought it would be. Now that's not to say that the next movie I direct that I'd want to play one of the main roles you know, probably not. And if I don't have to do any acting, that's fine too, or a small part. I, I did really particularly enjoy the days unfolding where I was directing Grady or Hannah Gross playing Gwen and these other characters or, you know, where I wasn't in it because I could be in my street clothes and just relate to the crew in a constant way as much the actors and all that. And uh, let me also ask you about the music because you composed the music for this film, right? And and this is let me this is not the first time. You also made some music for Jauja, the Lisandro Alonso, right? Is that yeah, Lisandro Alonso's Jauja. Uh, he doesn't until then his other movies. He'd never had music, yeah, um, and very little dialogue. Um, there's not a lot of dialogue in Jauja, but there's probably more dialogue in that movie than his. <laughs> 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 and he'd never used music, but suddenly one day after we'd finished shooting the movie, and I was also a producer on that movie, he said, I'm thinking I, this scene, I think I need a musical transition. And I'm thinking, wow, you know, we have no money. We're, you know, what are you talking about? He goes, well, something, maybe. It doesn't have to be music from that period. It's, it can be, you know, electric guitar. And I'm thinking, hmm. And, um, and maybe one at the end of the movie, too. So maybe two pieces. And I said, well, how long? He said, well, the first one, I don't know, it'd be like two minutes, two and a half minutes. And the other one could be a few minutes. I don't know. And I said, well, I could get you something for free that fits the bill. You know, <laughs> there's a musician I work with a lot, and we could play some things for you. 
and he liked them. So I ended up doing that with Buckethead and um, with me playing keyboards and him playing guitar. And um, yeah, and that's what I, on this movie, because I was on my own again, I started thinking about the, the music. I started thinking about what it might be in the period of waiting for financing. And I realized, I think, you know, early on that it should be austere. I liked the idea of piano being the bass of it. And um, I just started working on it because I was on my own. And, and by the time we started shooting, I had a pretty clear idea of where I wanted to have music and where I didn't and what type of music. And I started composing and, you know, I had some of it composed by the time we finished shooting and during the editing I finished. And so we were also running out of money. And, uh, and by the end of the editing, when it was time to do the score, record it, we didn't have to go for weeks in a studio and spend a bunch of money that we didn't have. Um, I mean, I took the money that I would have got for composing and I put that money also into the, the couple of days we needed. But in two days, we recorded everything and then mastered and, and mixed it, you know, mixed and mastered quickly and that's it. Um, but the score came out. It's called Music for Falling. It's out as of last Friday. And it's wherever you can stream music or, or buy music oh, on any platform. Music for Falling. And it's it's nice. And it's some of the versions, some of the pieces are more extended versions of what's in the movie. So it's slightly longer. And of course, it has that great song that's at the end credits, Skating Polly's A Little Late which is not an original song made for this movie, but it feels like it, which is why I yeah. asked if I could use it. I knew this before we started shooting because the lyrics, it's almost like they're written about this story and it is piano based. So it followed from the, from the, the score I, I had created. And um, there's also a really cool, if you guys want to look, it's even available on YouTube. If you look up skating poly music for falling or a little late video, we made a, it's like five and a half minutes long, like the song. And it's behind the scenes, it's like a making of video. There's stills, there's footage set to this song. And it's a really beautiful, if you like this movie at all, I would recommend look up the Skating Polly song for Falling, that video. It's a really, you get to see a little bit of the behind the scenes stuff too uh, on the set. And uh, it's a nice video. So. That's okay. it. Okay. So, and this is a question that not related to the movie, but I have a I have a a, a book from um, Yoshitomo Nara here in somewhere oh, yeah. around here, yeah. and uh, not so time. long not so long ago I was looking I was doing some research and then I realized that it's your publishing company. Yeah. So I didn't know that. And so is that like when you have free time, <laughs> like you publish um, books? I don't really have free time, but but yeah, no, <laughs> uh, we started the publishing house Percival Press, and obviously there's a movie making arm. We've we've produced several movies, including Falling, uh, Percival Pictures. Uh, Percival Press was founded in 2002, and it's going to this day. And we don't do a lot of, you know, uh, titles. Uh, some years more than other, depending on how busy I am with other things, because I do oversee as an editor you know, all the books we make and the music we put out. Um, yeah, with uh, Yoshitomo Nara's book is one we did. That was one we did, one of the few books we've done. We've done two books, I think, in co collaboration with someone else. That was done with the Cleveland uh, Museum, the Modern Art mm -hmm. Museum of Cleveland. And um, yeah, we do art books, poetry in different languages, uh, a lot of art books, some novels, um, social commentary. I mean, there's no one type. We just, I, I just try to publish books. I mean, the idea sprang from like you want to share a story, which is, I would say, the same thing about making falling. You, know, you can think of a story or you read a story by someone else and you want to share it and you give it to your friends to read. And so we always try to publish things that might not get published or not in the way that the author might like. And that's sort of the idea behind it. And and through Percival, I also publish my own stuff because that brings in a little income and helps sort of make up for other titles that maybe don't make as much. And, you know, it sort of more or less stays afloat that way. And yeah, 
that's that's yeah. where did you get that did you buy it at a museum store or something uh i don't know like yeah. i know I, maybe i i'm not sure how i got it um i see you have a lot of art books so yeah so my uh my biggest weaknesses are the the museums uh bookstores uh every time i go to a museum yeah, i spend i spend way too much money there <laughs> so I do, the same. I do the same like yeah um yeah you can see like but it's it's uh i i can't remember where i got it but i got it like a few years ago so um yeah can remember exactly where yeah anyway. yeah well Vigo, thank you so much we hope that to have you back anytime and hopefully okay. with your next film so thank I, you so I look much forward to it. in the meantime take good care of yourself and others and same goes to anybody watching and I look forward to actually doing this the next time where I can see your faces and hear yeah. your voices and uh, and we can get into a, another good conversation, but a two-way conversation. Face I to face. Very much. And take care of yourselves and, and good luck. And uh, go look at that Skating Polly video. It's really nice. It's beautiful. We're, we can link it on, on when we publish, yeah. we can link it to the YouTube video. Do you want to, um, whoever you're in contact with that, that's working with me, ask them to send you, they have the high res versions of that. Yeah. Ask them to send you the Skating Polly video, the making of video, music video, and and the soundtrack record, Music for Falling, might as well, yeah. if you want. Okay, awesome. Let me